Hey, this is Nicole calling from Hamilton, and I needed to let everyone know that I really proudly support Vish and creative control. I have for many years, I will for many more, as long as he keeps delivering these amazing interview podcasts. When you hear one of Vish's interviews, you think he's known this guest for years, they're good friends. Uh, but the truth is, he approaches every interview, whether it's sort of up and coming indie artists or established icons or like famous intimidating comedians with. Uh, a really deep, genuine curiosity, so he's never met this person, and the same really warm uh, candor, as so he's known them forever. I think it really lends to a great chat, no matter who he's talking to, and for that reason, I think you should throw Vish, like what, a dollar a month? He's got jokes. The jokes make it worth it. Support Creative Control on Patreon. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Visha's wife, and remember, when you name a dog Janet or Timothy, you are dragging humanity down just a little bit. Silkworm is kind of an interesting case in that, like, they're a band that had a long arc where they started out very scrappy, extremely energetic and quite scattershot, and then they refined their approach and honed their approach and their skills and became a truly magnificent band that was then ended tragically. So there's a, a... a complete encapsulation of the evolution of a band from, you know, buddies playing in the basement in high school through becoming a a truly outstanding exemplary rock band and making magnificent records. Like that entire arc was captured and documented and that's pretty rare. Andy Cohen, Tim Midyet, and Steve Albini are old friends who each originally hail from Missoula, Montana. In 1987, Andy and Tim began playing in a band called Silkworm, who spent considerable time in Seattle, Washington, beginning in the early 1990s. After working with him on an EP, Silkworm asked Albini to record their second full-length album, In the West, which was released by CZ Records in 1994. The label Comedy Minus One has rescued this out-of-print classic with the new 25th anniversary deluxe edition of In the West, which marks its first appearance on vinyl and includes previously unheard live material, fresh liner notes, and a remix and remaster of the original album by Albini and Matthew Barnhart, respectively. I recently had a chat with Andy and Tim about In the West and later caught up with Steve, too, to get their insights into Silkworm, making in the West a specific guitar part by Pavement, Hellgate High School, recording singers singing, maintaining one's passion in the face of futility, future plans, and more. A part of the E1 Podcast Network with the support of listeners like you who subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control plus in-kind support From Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton, this is the 514th episode of Creative Control, featuring the thoughtful and talented Steve Albini and Andy Cohen and Tim Midget of Silkworm, with your host, me, Vish Khanna.
Hi, Andy. How's it going? Hi, Vish. It's going quite well. Nice to chat with you again. Where in the world are you? I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in my corporate office. <laughs> I hope. I hope. I hope they don't mind that I'm. I'm. I'm piggybacking on their Wi-Fi for this call. <laughs> okay, that's right. You've <laughs> recently relocated to Massachusetts. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And how's that going? Uh, I think it's going well. I mean, if you look at it on paper, everything's going great. Kids are liking school fine. The community we moved to is historic, cute, and fun. Job is just fine. I have no complaints. Okay. And wait, sorry, how old are your kids? They are seven, 12 today, and 13. Okay. 12 today. Oh, happy, wow. happy yeah. birthday. That's great. What if you've made time to talk to me on one of your children's birthdays? That's amazing. Well, you're actually more important than my children, so yes, anytime for you. <laughs> I ask because uh, I'm also going to be moving soon, uh, and I'm worried. And a, a, a far distance, mm. a fair distance after 23 years in one city, I'm moving, and uh, I'm worried. Where about, are you moving? I'm going to be moving to Edmonton, Alberta. Oh wow! Whoa! Yeah, my wife. That's not that. <laughs> that's a that's quite a change. It is. It is a change. <laughs> it is a change. My wife is from Edmonton, and we both landed our own uh, form of corporate jobs. And uh, it seemed like uh, it seemed like the time to go. But this, by the way, this is not meant to be about me and my moving hassles. I just wanted to bring that up. We can talk more later because I'm mostly worried about the kids. Like you brought up, the kids are happy in school. That's why I just instantly I'm like, oh, my God, I got to that's my biggest fear, frankly, like, you know. So anyway, that's fine. Anyway, Andy, it's nice to chat with you. Uh, Tim, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Nice to speak with you again. It's been a long time. Where in the world are you? I'm in Edmonton, Alberta. <laughs> Scoping out uh, housing for me and my family. That's I'm buying, very... <laughs> I'm buying, I'm buying Oilers jerseys. <laughs> <laughs> to fit in. No, I'm in. Uh, I'm in uh, Chicago in my house in my home office. Nice, nice. It's good. Yeah. To, it's good to speak with you again. You're no plans to enough. no plans to move at this point. Oh, I hope not. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, it's good. As sad as it was uh, for to have Andy move, I'm not going to move to Boston. No, I don't. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's. I can't. I can't say that it's so much better and more exciting that everyone should move here. That's for sure. I feel like I was just talking to, I've talked to a few people from Chicago lately, and uh, people are moving from the city. Uh, key people, I would say. Is that fair to say? I've, I've... Uh, I don't know. You know, a lot of people uh, end up going to L.A., it seems like, because, um, you know, it's not brutally cold there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can live a kind of life there that is manageable and not a hell of a lot of money. So, right. you know, I, I do know people who've gone who've gone there. Or sometimes people move to, you know, Nashville or Memphis or whatnot because it's cheaper. Austin, San Francisco, some of the people I'm thinking of ended up there. So Yeah, yeah well, you know, they're cosmopolitan, so they want to <laughs> see the see the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, they this... want to see the world and they want to go broke in the process. Right, right. <laughs> right. Right. Well, hopefully they're all doing just fine uh in their moves. Um this is almost a nice segue for the fact that we're talking about a record called In the West. Uh, you know, people heading west, I guess, is what we established there. Didn't quite, yeah, work. Didn't quite work. But uh, uh, first of all, congratulations on the 25th anniversary of this, uh, this album. Uh, Tim, how are you feeling about this 25 years ago? Oh, I can't. It, you know, it, it doesn't really compute. I don't feel very so much older. I mean, when I think about back then, we do seem like kids, I guess, but... 25 years is a real long time, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I, I don't feel like uh, I don't feel like it was any longer ago than stuff that happened like 10 years ago, you know, so it's, it's real weird. It, it is kind of weird, right? We're all just doing our thing, living our lives, and then someone comes along and reminds you, someone or an artifact even, maybe in this case a record is just hanging out on your shelf, reminding you like, hey, by the way, it's been 25 years. And you're like, what? I've just been living my life. I don't think about this. I don't think about <laughs> yeah. this time passing by. What's going on, right? And, yeah. Andy, how do you feel? I feel kind of the same way. The The sensation of the time has no resonance for me. Like it could have been yesterday, honestly. What makes it seem more distant is just kind of when you listen to this record, like the music is pretty different than where we ended up later in our careers that I think about more. Yeah. So, I mean, I got to be honest with you, like I'll, I'll go there and say that this record represents to me a less than mature version of what we later be what we were. 
Mm. And it has some elements to it that I, I hesitate to say that because it has elements to it that are unlike anything we ever did later. And so that makes me think it's not a maturity factor as much as just a change. But yeah. there are other elements that are just worse versions of what came later, which is more like the maturity situation. Yeah, there's some stuff that you only get when you're young, a certain kind of jitteriness or exuberance or uh, kind of like headlong quality, you know, that totally. I think we wears off over time. And that yeah. this record has that for sure. So and that comes out, I think, in a couple ways, like, you know, like I, one, some of it is obvious, like the tempos are, are for us pretty fast and the vocals are yelped and the <laughs> guitar playing is frantic. Crazy. But it also comes out, at least I'll talk about me personally, like I think for Tim too, a little bit, I can think of an example or two, like the song structures, like there are complex interregnums in these songs that never appear later. Like it's just different. And that was also, that's kind of an expression of that youthful, like, got to get it out there kind of energy, too. There's a certain bravado and boastfulness in youthful playing, isn't there? You know, like, this is what, you figure out how to do something somewhat complicated, and then you, you kind of want to yeah. show it off a little bit. Kind of, and I think you also just get jacked. Like, um, <laughs> you know, we made the this record and the record right after at Libertine were made real fast, you know, like three and a half days, hmm. including setup in the studio with Steve Albini who recorded them. And that's not very much time to, uh, to record <laughs> an entire album's worth of music and mix it. You know, that's yeah, yeah. very little time. So, and it was new to us, you know, so we're in there and we're all jacked about being there and we're under these time constraints. So it just turns out, you know, it has a certain kind of frantic quality to it that, um, our later records probably don't have. So so was any of this, I mean, Andy, you say you look back and it, it, it marks a point in time in the band's aesthetic, but was your aesthetic ever kind of articulated among the members at that point? I mean, you, I know as young people, we don't, I remember being in bands and we didn't really talk about it. We just sort of started to play. I'm just curious, was anything kind of articulated? Like this is the kind of band we're going to try to be uh, at that point? Wow. Uh I, I'll, I'll say no. I think, I feel like we all just understood. Uh, yeah. We'd been playing together for quite a few years at that t by the time we made this record already. We'd been playing together since 1985, and this record we made in 1993 or four, 93, probably. I don't yeah. quite remember. Right. Um, so it'd been years. So we'd sort of matured together over the course of from teenagers to young manhood at this point. So we didn't have to say, we didn't really talk about the aims that way. It was just obvious. I mean, um, t I'll, t I'll say something about I'll say something about that that again may not seem intuitive to a listener, and I don't know if Tim agrees or not. The other thing I think that's weird about, especially the early Worm, is that in our estimation, our goal was pretty simple, which was to play this really rockin' music with challenging lyrical subject matter, hmm. and that's <laughs> it sounds pretty boring, but uh, that's kind of what it was, and it just came out this way. Tim, do you want to follow up on what Andy's saying there? I think it's just all feel, you know, and yeah. um, and just trying to do something that feels good to do, that feels uh, expressive of whatever is going through your mind or your body at that time, you know. And it's uh, it's real, real basic. There's no um, concept, you know. Any, yeah. Anything conceptual is kind of a uh, an not really an overlay, but it's an interpretation of what we happen to do, you know? Well, there's, yeah. there's two there's two trains of thought that sort of came up. One, Andy saying, in retrospect, this isn't the, the band we became, and there's things we did here that we wouldn't do again. Um, oh, yeah. And then at the same time, Tim, you're saying we were jacked. You know, we were, we were, we were really on it. Like, we were kind of attacking uh, this material in a yeah. cer certain kind of way. So I guess what I'm wondering is, if you think back on it, like, you know, what Andy's saying is in hindsight, in retrospect, did the band feel kind of assured of itself and its direction in making in the West? Like, did you kind of? Oh, yeah. That's what that's I, kind I, of what I'm getting at. I think we did. I think that um, I think we always felt pretty sure of our direction. I, I don't remember ever feeling um, insecure about that. I mean, we always had kind of a pretty high opinion of what we were doing, that it was good, you know, because it excited us. If it didn't excite us, we wouldn't. It wouldn't make it out of out of uh, practice if if it didn't excite us, you know. Right. So our our tastes developed or changed over time, and um, and there's a lot of stuff on the record that 
we wouldn't do over that is totally cool i think you know like there's the guitar playing has this weird sort of speed metal edge to it that like our own kind of version of that you know that that was gone after that record pretty much and uh well, completely, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't. I, I know where it came from, uh, and I'm really glad it's there. But I wouldn't try to do that now. You know, that's well, not really yeah. my. Kind well, of a couple points I'll make about similar points are, one was just I feel like we were very confident, and this record and the way we played at this time were such, in my opinion, my memory such successful expressions of what we were trying to do and what we were all about that starting now at this point i personally was always baffled that like this band wasn't you know like a a major league popular band because that's what i mean is this stuff seems so fully realized to me then and it basically still does for what it is that i was like how can other people not be overwhelmed by the rockiness of this music <laughs> and a lot and some some people were don't get me wrong we had plenty of fans don't get me wrong yeah. i'm just saying like that distinction between sort of indie rock and normal rock or whatever was never in i think most at least my mind really it was just this was awesome rock oh, music but, and, yeah but in retrospect listening yes. to it it's totally <laughs> weird like there's <laughs> It's yeah. really weird music, and um, it sounds weird, and we play weird. Like, um, I don't know, having yeah. sort of settled into whatever I've settled into now, which probably is weird, um, <laughs> it, it, it really seems odd to me. And going back, I was shocked when the record after this one, Libertine, we put that one out again first, and uh, it got reissued before In the West did, even though it came out after In the West. But when we went back and listened to that, I hadn't heard it at all until Andy and I went in to master it with Bob Weston. And uh, I was like, holy shit, this record is A, awesome, and, and B, completely odd. Like there was stuff on there that I was just like, I don't know why I did that that way. But I'm glad I did, you know. I wouldn't yeah. choose to do it that way now because I wouldn't think of it, you know. Yep. This phenomenon Tim is describing is the single biggest um, out, sort of out of body experience. It's not that it's 25 years ago. That doesn't really resonate, at least for me. It's not that that you know I think of these stylistic elements like the speed metal stuff that I don't do anymore. That's not that weird. Actually, going back and listening to it, like Tim said, especially this record, even more than Libertine, although that's similar, yeah, it's, it's just like, oh my god, like <laughs> why is it this way? And how did we how did we even do it? Like. And that gets to another point is, this is a little bit unique too, because this is still in a phase of the band where we practiced obsessively Mm. and we're just learning as we went and teaching each other as we went that way. Um, And it kind of comes through. That's part of the weirdness. I think we were so far in our own little rat hole of ourselves and doing our own thing that that's partially why it came out this way. Later records, we practiced much less. And I think it shows in you know, not in a bad way, but just it shows. Right. Okay. Well, I, I let's 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 set the scene a little bit for this time period as you've, you've you've been doing that a little bit. But like, first of all, Tim, where was Silkworm at the time uh, you were working on these songs and making and uh, you know subsequently making this record? But where were you when you were formulating this material? Well, I mean, physically, we're in Seattle, Washington, and we put out some singles and stuff with people, various people. A couple were self released. We put out a self released album that we were sort of, you know, piece, piecing out, you know, the sales of that a little bit. We'd put out a couple of cassettes that um, were, you know, like distributed by Kay and whatnot. Uh, and Calvin Johnson still has the money from them, I think, because I never got it from him. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 he, I'm not saying he stole it from us, but, uh, you know. That is some, never... That's 30-year-old shade. That's amazing. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I, I never. I don't have anything bad to say about Calvin. But um, <laughs> I know he's had his issues with people, but he, he's a good-hearted guy as far as I'm concerned. But um, okay. anyway, um, we were in Seattle, and we were just kind of kicking against the pricks, really, you know. I mean – we were in a scene that didn't have any use for us, uh, seemingly. There were some bands we felt kinship with, like Tree People or Caustic Resin, although those bands were so weird uh, that you know we didn't really connect on a personal level. To, <laughs> but there were some band, other bands like Engine Kid and Jessamine where we really found kindred spirits and and real deep friendships. You know, so but we were part of a very small scene of like 
if you want to call it that, like little little sort of lifeboat with like three bands in it. So um, <laughs> that was basically where we were, and we were playing wherever we could around town, or we'd go to Bellingham, we'd go to Eugene, we'd go to Portland, we'd go to Spokane, you know, we'd go to Bremerton, you know, <laughs> we just yeah, yeah. we take shows wherever we could get them, and we were really scrapping, you know, yeah, hardcore, and and we did that for three or four years in Seattle, like longer than most bands are around. That's how much time we spent just in Seattle, not ca- including Montana, just like scrambling, you know? Yeah, and we, yeah. but we started touring and that was really kind of the saving grace of the band is when we got out of town and we went to San Francisco, we went to Chicago and people showed up and people were into it. Uh, not like throngs, you know, but enough people to, to fill a small club or something, you know? Right. And that, 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 that's not like we needed outside approval because we were super duper insular. We could have just played in the basement kind of perpetually almost, but that helps, you know? Why, why, why were you insular? Do you have a, any, well, any perspective up, on that? Yes. Up Montana, hundred percent. You know, we grew up in Missoula, Montana, where to paraphrase Linda and fast times at Ridgemont high, you know, we barely had cable TV. Right. So, you know, we, we didn't know all we knew is what, we came across from records we picked up at record stores or ordered through the mail from SST or whatever. Like it was totally uh, not random, but it was piecemeal. Hmm. And um, the crowd, there were people there who appreciated what we did, but by and large, people were either hostile to it or didn't care. And we had to, that's the environment we came up in. We had to do it for ourselves, you know. It was like the most DIY thing uh, possible. I know a lot of people yeah. have that experience, but we definitely had it. Okay. Yeah, and it's funny because then going to Seattle was not as much of a change as you might envision because as Tim has already set the stage, sure, it was this huge uh, not- and notorious music scene at the time, but that didn't affect us that, that much because we weren't accepted into that world. So we kind of continued with our coterie of, of fellow travelers and small number of fans who were devoted. It was sort of just like a version of Missoula that had more shitty jobs so we could actually support ourselves and um, more places to play so we could play more often. In terms of the influence on the music, it was exactly the same, meaning we influenced each other and we had a few bands that we saw that we liked. And then other than that, it was uh, we were like apart from the whole scene at the time, so we weren't really influenced by what was happening there. Yeah. Uh, there's a, a couple of things I just want to home in on. Uh, first of all, and we'll I'll, I'll put them in a sequence. First of all, I, 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 I am curious about how you ended up in Seattle. So, Andy, maybe you can speak to that. But I, I also want to follow up on this feeling of insularity, meaning, you know, Tim saying you guys were insular. And then you're saying on a, in a sense that maybe the Seattle scene didn't accept you. Maybe there was insularity already inherent in that town. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure the town itself was probably confused about all the scrutiny <laughs> that was placed on it in the in the wake of, you know, oh God, the yeah. success of Nirvana and whatnot. <laughs> so I imagine there's a suspicion of people coming from out of town. But so let me let me go back to my first question. Andy, when and why did you guys end up in Seattle? Yeah, so uh, late in the Montana days, um, Tim first went to college, and then Silkworm started with me and Joel and, and some other people, including Ben from the uh, the Einheit band that was the original drummer. And then we had a little bit of a revolving cast because Tim Bing came back from college, and I left I left town for college. I went to New York, and uh, Tim rejoined a little before that, but then continued while I was gone. So uh, the, the, I'll just tell you the pivotal event in my personal history was around the sort of middle of, or late 1989, um, I got this postcard from Tim saying, hey, me and Joel are moving to Seattle to keep going with the silkworm. Um, Ben's not moving. You want to come or something like that. And at that moment, I got this postcard and I was perfectly happy at college. It was one of those bolts from the blue where I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm, I'm going to do that. And so, um, you know, I dropped out of college and moved with those guys. And that was in very late 1989. Right. So that's how we ended up in Seattle. I think the reasons for going to Seattle were 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 uh, were that it was the closest big city. At that time, it already had a burgeoning music scene, meaning we thought there would be more more people to connect with. But more importantly, more places to play because we just wanted to play a lot more. And 
I sort of made some one attempt to like convince those guys to move to New York on some phone call, but they were like, uh, <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> that was kind of a, a bridge too far. And I was like, yeah, I get it. So that was kind of how we ended up in Seattle. Okay. Yeah. Andy, I actually, now that I think about it, you talked about this the last time you were on the show. I remember this now, but, uh, Tim, okay. I guess, Tim, you precipitated it. Why, why is that, is what Andy's saying? Kind of the same reasons you had for moving yeah. out there? Yeah. Yeah. You, you can drive there and I, we'd been there and, I, I had very fond feelings about Chicago having lived there for a while, but I didn't particularly um, see a way to go back there and live the kind of scroungy life that um, we we figured we were going to have to lead to do what we wanted to do, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We were all kind of signing up for like pretty, um, pretty scroungy existence. And we knew yeah. people who did that in Seattle. We, right. we, we knew personally we were friendly with, a dozen people you know in yeah. town who did that so and this is something that just occurred to me in retrospect the appeal of seattle really at that time it was still much more of a provincial capital than it is now that it's sort of a you know it is what it is a corporate you, you know world break world beater or whatever it is yeah um so f honestly and this was uh, i didn't think this at the time but now looking back i can see what it was it sort of represented a big version of missoula so we had a comfort level which was not that expensive easy to get scroungy jobs we could see a way to scrounge around there the way you do in missoula except it would be better because the jobs might be more plentiful and there's more places to play right whereas chicago or new york were just a little bit they're too distant and they're we just didn't have connections there frankly okay. at least i didn't that okay. would really facilitate that now i i, I do I, I mean for people who don't know um i we should say we're we're missing people today um mm -hmm. And um, can we, uh, you know, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, uh, frankly, mm -hmm. I guess, Tim, who are we missing today? Uh, we're missing uh, two people. Uh, one of them is Joel Robert Logan Phelps, who lives in Vancouver, B.C., and uh, is an amazing guitar player and singer and works as a, um, a drug and alcohol counselor, counseling people on, uh, with regards to substance abuse and stuff. And Joel is doing that he's a busy guy and he's off doing his thing i've talked to him for a little bit but i love him you know he's my brother and stuff and then our our brother in arms michael dahlquist who uh played drums in the in the band uh, amazing drummer i think honestly probably not not really on in the west quite yet but starting with the next record libertine and certainly the ones following i think he became the best like basic hard rock drummer of his of his generation and uh michael died in um 2005 yeah. on um on july uh 14th of 2005 uh in in uh, the chicago area after we moved out here right yeah okay uh I, I thank you for establishing that for for people who don't know and as always uh i'm sorry they're both not here if that makes sense yeah 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 now, yeah. uh, the reason I ask about this is because I'm just interested about the, interested in the dynamic of the band around this time. We've kind of talked about the sound of In the West already, and and you've invoked uh, speed metal, I think, and various <laughs> other <laughs> various other influences. Um, just on a practical level, I'm wondering about how songwriting worked. I mean, who are the? I guess let's let's go with this, Andy. Who are the principal lyric and songwriters in Silkworm at this time? Yeah. Um, well, it, by this time, I, I don't remember the exact breakdown on this record, but we sort of democratized the lyric and songwriting. Uh, I'll just contextualize it for you a little bit. Sure. When Silkworm started in 1987, Joel was the only songwriter and we played a couple covers. And so, you know, Tim had been a songwriter prior to that, but at that point he wasn't yet in the band. And so we were just playing Joel's song, basically. Um, I was still in high school at the time, mm -hmm. by the way. So then toward the end of my high school career, uh, Tim came back, like I said, and started contributing. And in that little short phase of the band, I think they were, I don't know, 50-50 or something like that, maybe 60-40, because Joel had more of a catalog built up at the time. Mm -hmm. We moved to Seattle, and I sort of started writing after our first year, year and a half there. And by this record, I was probably still a junior partner, but you know, significant contributor. So the dynamic was basically, you know, we still had Joel cranking out hits that were great. Um, <laughs> we had Tim doing the same, and then we had me adding in. So uh, 
we had at this point three distinctive songwriters, each of whom sang lead vocals on whatever songs they happened to write. Right. Okay. And and I want to I want to say a little bit about the songwriting in Silkworm, especially in this era. So you have your sort of singer songwritery stereotype of the person who writes the song, including the lyrics and all the music, brings them to the band, tells them what to play, and that's it. It wasn't really like that with the Worm. My recollection of how this really worked was you would have someone who wrote the song, and so. And they're, they're, they're obviously a spectrum of how this works, but generally the person would write the song, uh, meaning the lyrics, the vocal melody, and the basic chords, and maybe even a riff or two for some of the other, for some songs, but not all. Okay. And then bring it, and then bring it in. And then the band, vir- by virtue of this practicing four or five nights a week for many hours, would would sort of forge the song together. So that would conventionally be called arrangement. But it was very intensive in this period. Mm. Um, and so, especially on this record, a lot of these, you know, I, I really think of them as sort of joint compositions, you yeah, know, totally. more than you would expect, uh, just like the typical stereotype. Um, if I had to put people on a spectrum, I'd say Tim was the best at fully, re- fully sort of writing and realizing songs, including, you know, occasionally signature wrists and stuff and bringing them to the band. Um, Joel was probably the most sort of nebulous, like just, and we probably did the most work arranging Joel's and I was somewhere in the middle. Um, but generally it was really a collective effort to get them sounding the way they sound. I see. Okay. But Tim, just to follow up on that, did you, mm-hmm. would you ever sort of jam out instrumentals and sort of dole out tasks, singing, songwriting, or is it more? What no, you, never. Okay. No, no, not really. I mean, we would do that, but we would do it. Someone would be like, Hey, here's, here's the thing I came up with. And then you just start playing it and everyone would start playing. And then you'd be like, you change and everyone to kind of figure out what you did when you changed. And because we played together so much, you were unlikely to be incredibly shocked by whatever happened next, you know. Mm. And then some of these interstitial parts, Andy sort of alluded to, were a product of the band saying, this song just got boring. So what if we did this here, you know, and play Then you play some doodle on your instrument and everybody go oh yeah okay or they go nah that sucks or whatever you know yeah and as i recall like there's a saying in uh sports ball don't lie right Uh like if you get if you get a foul call and you didn't deserve it you're gonna miss the free throw uh (laughs) well the band don't lie either and if you brought something in and it wasn't gonna work no one would put the time into it to make it try to make it work it would just become obvious over a course of a slogging through it a few times that it wasn't catching fire, you know? Yeah. And uh, that happened. And honestly, it, probably, it happened more with me because I, I wrote more than those guys did, but my batting average was lower. Um, <laughs> like and Andy would bring stuff in and almost always it worked. He wrote the least, but it would almost always work. And then Joel uh, would bring stuff in. And even if it wasn't totally finished, which most time it wasn't, there was almost always something there that was great, you know, right. but I would come up with things that were sort of half baked sometimes, honestly. And, and I had to, I had to, uh, get good at recognizing, all right, uh, time to shelve that piece of shit. You know? <laughs> right. Right. Now, I mean, earlier, uh, I think it was Andy who said, you know, we had this idea of writing challenging lyrics, uh, with sort of loud music or something along those lines. Um, I'm curious about for each of you, if you now have any, particularly since you've revisited the album for this reissue, if you have any kind of overarching perspective about each other's uh, lyrical approach or lyrical themes uh, and ideas, musical ideas that appear on this record. Um, Because I have the two of you here, I actually wonder, and I don't want this to get awkward, but I thought it would be <laughs> <laughs> thought it would be interesting to ask uh, w- each of you about the other, and and we can within that we can talk about Joel as well. I hope. But let's start with Andy. Andy, do you have any particular perspective on Tim's sort of lyrical and thematic ideas that might be emerging on his songs? Wow, I've honestly never thought about it before. I ask um, the, I ask the big questions on this show. That's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, I'll tell you the honest truth, which is, and this is true of Tim and Joel, I've probably only listened to the lyrics on half at most of the songs that they sing, and maybe even more like a third. Huh. So um, some of the songs, the, the the lyrics are just not 
prominent in the vocal line and it's more about the music. Mm -hmm. So let me contrast a song like Garden City Blues, which is a lyrical and musical masterpiece, in my opinion. So I, know, I, I, Blue, I, I agree completely. <laughs> so Garden so Garden City Blues, I listen to the lyrics. They mean a lot. They mean exactly what they say. And they, they're able to and they're able to do that and convey sort of a a, a muscular wistfulness that is pretty unique because a lot of times you get wistfulness or you get muscularity, but they don't meet. And I'm very suspicious of sentimentality in general, but that song skirts the boundary of sentimentality and is just into remembrance. Um, t t so, time is winding down, I believe, is one of the lyrics in that song. Uh, and this notion of sort of feeling isolation all around you, is that does that resonate? Yeah. With? Yeah. Yeah, so it has universal themes, but are you know it's very particularized because it's obviously about the Garden City, right? Mm -hmm. And that's our that's all of our experience there. So it wasn't just him singing about it. You know, I feel like it feels like a song I could have written if I were better or had had that inspiration or something. So it's very so it's just on all levels it sort of resonates with me in a great way. For the, for, um, the, for those of us who don't know, where is the Garden City, and is it close to Paradise City? Yeah, I think the Garden City, I don't know if it's an official or unofficial motto of Missoula. I think, I, I kind of get this sense that it was a, a failed attempt to have a motto. Right. Because I don't Could know be. that that's yeah. the real motto. Okay, okay, I see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So you, you've chosen this song as sort of representative of, of something going on. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the avatar of, I think, the best version of Tim Mid yet. Okay. And he has other songs. He probably has more hits later, hits meaning hits on this kind of level of quality mm -hmm. later in our career but this is an early indicator of what he's capable of i have to look at a song list to remember the well, other ones I, that are on the track i, I didn't oh, mean okay, to, but i then, didn't i didn't but mean then, to put you know, on no, the spot no. go I, ahead go ahead no, let, me, let me contrast that with another song in this record which i think is a good song but is not certainly like high in the tim mid yet canon that's this <laughs> song and that's this song enough is enough okay and i, I I know personally that this song is a, is a notch, say, below Garden City Blues because totally. I enjoy things about this song and I really enjoyed things about playing it. And it's really cool how it's quiet and then, you know, the contrast with the loud. I mean, just like it's arranged really nicely for what it is, but it's 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 shallower. It has similar yeah. kind of themes to, to Garden City Blues, but it's not as universal. It's more <laughs> like a conventional love and, and I miss you kind of song. Mm. So... Right. I don't want to say it's a bad song. I'm just saying it's not a masterpiece. No, the, and the thing the thing is funny too about that one is that it should be more universal because it's more dumb in the lyrics. Like the lyrics yes. are very <laughs> not they're not evocative. They're just kind of duh duh duh. And uh, but somehow yeah. it fails <laughs> in it doing the thing it should be able to do. You know, which is dumb it down enough to communicate with a bunch of people. It, it's not that it's bad. It just doesn't do it as effectively as the other one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. that's what I mean. So, yeah. so, so Tim at his best can do the 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 prior, the former, the Garden City Blues thing, you know. And then if it doesn't quite hit, it's still good. It's just not, you know, it's not a masterpiece. Okay, so um, so this got see, then, this got more awkward at, than I thought it was going to get. I, oh, this no, no, is great, no, 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 but it's very honest. It's it's good. Yeah, <laughs> it's not, I, not, not, not awkward for us. Okay, good. Good. I look at songs like Punch Drug Five. Yeah. In Can Deuce. I honestly don't know if I've ever listened to the lyrics on either of those songs. Hmm. Okay, that's fascinating. Like, that's... And, and I enjoy the, both of those songs a lot, especially in Candus. But it's just, I don't know, they're more of a piece of music more than just like a song where I get a meaning out of them. So you're so basically, Andy, you're you're like you're telling the, the sound person, can I get a little less vocal on the monitor? I don't need to hear <laughs> what these guys are talking about. That's you in a nutshell. Okay, I, I, I get it. I get it. Uh, Tim, yeah. s Tim, similar exercise. Do you want to speak? Yeah, up? <laughs> this is going to be painful on this record because I'll just say right now that I got a lot better later. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say if you either of you want to talk a little bit about Joel as well, obviously that would be great. Yeah. But but Tim, uh, please again, let's indulge in some of this thing, the stuff that I'm finding awkward. But it's great. I I, I, I this is th these are the kinds of conversations you guys are probably never going to have, right? Or, or discussions. Yeah. So well, but and we we also have no. I, I think I can speak for both of us. We have a huge collective ego about what we've done. We think it's great, but I don't have no ego about my own work okay, as good. far as my input at all. And I don't think Andy does either. Okay. Um, no. But the one thing I would say about Garden City Blues, I do think it's a masterpiece. 
But if you take what I brought into the band, it's like four chords played one after another. And like, if, you, if I try to play that on my own, it's impossible because hmm. it's <laughs> incredibly boring. But um, you add in Michael doing what he did on it and you add in Joel playing it the way he played it and you add in Andy playing what he played over the top and it freed me up to do some things that I hadn't imagined doing in the middle of it. And the whole thing turned into something else. You know, the only reason it is the way it is is because the group did that. You know? Right. Okay. Um, so as much as I'd like to take total credit for it, uh, and as <laughs> awesome as the lyrics are, but um, but Andy has this ability to just write about stuff that's so jarring and out of nowhere that um, I couldn't imagine. I I couldn't. He has some songs from later on that I won't mention because we're not talking about those records that I could imagine having written and wish I'd written, but there's a, a whole raft of them that I'm like, man, I don't know where that comes from. You know, yeah. I don't, I don't know where that lyric comes from. Like, how do you, did you take that from a book or like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, you know, yeah. where, where did you take to like, um, let's go into the woods and live with the bears out where you can kill someone and nobody cares. I would never put that in song. It's pretty, I'm, pretty striking. I'm overjoyed yeah. that he did it, you know? And, uh, I just wouldn't have the, it's not in there, you know, it's not in my mind. And that's the coolest thing about this period of the band is that you had my sort of, um, at worst maudlin at best kind of strongly emotional, um, take on just kind of, life and that maelstrom of being in your 20s and trying to figure out who you are in the world and then you have joel's kind of yet more at worst melodramatic at best like incredibly over the top powerful take on kind of the same thing yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> and yeah. then you who's pretty fucking cold-blooded like you know and i think it's an awesome mix and if it was all me it would be worse and if it was all joel it would probably be worse than it would be a very short record. Um, and <laughs> if it was all Andy, it would be great, but it would take a few years for the record to get made, you know, and because there were three of us, we could cherry pick, you know, I didn't yeah. have to put all my crappy songs on there. Well, and that, that, yeah. that was one of the, that's the best thing about having that many people contributing. Um, yeah. One of the, one, sure. one of the reasons I ask these kinds of lyrics questions, I suppose, is that, I feel uh, bands are interesting because they usually it starts out as a social. If, if you're lucky, I think it starts out as a social kind of convention. Like you're just kind yeah. of getting together because you're friends, and this is something you all agree with. But then when yeah. you get into songwriting and processing other people's lyrics, I feel like you have a window into your friend that you wouldn't yes. normally that most people would never have. Like into yeah. their feelings and thoughts. That I I just think that's a very special and unique dynamic that not a lot of people have unless they're you do, unless, and, unless they're reading you know someone stole your diary and read it uh that's well, yeah <laughs> and, and 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 we were on the road together in cramped in into a, a fucking banner a suburban for a while yeah <laughs> like totally on top of each other like having to live together like that and uh you learn a lot about each other that way too i would say as far as joel's concerned like joel i think that garden city blues is me catching up with joel just for a second yeah. Um, yeah. And then, uh, and there are instances on the first record with Scruffy or Homo Activity, these songs on the first record, where Andy and I caught up with him. But we didn't really catch up with him until Libertine. And um, he was the, he was the, he was the guy when it came to just being able to fully realize something. And you hear that in Spades on that record. And he only he doesn't have that many songs on it. I guess three. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But uh, Pilot is great. And then Dream 8 on that record is just fucking over the top. Yeah, very like, intense. When, yeah. I, when I heard that uh, again, uh, I was just like stunned by it. I couldn't believe mm-hmm. how awesome it was. And yeah, I mean, you talk about having a, like a window uh, into someone's life, you know, and what they're feeling like. Like, I remember when he sang that song in the studio and hearing him do it. And you're like, what's happening down there? You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know where that comes from. And then he double tracked it. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't just totally a spur of the moment, but uh, you know, you hear that and you're like, Oh my God. Like, and even then being clueless, like we were and young and dumb, I felt clued into something there and listening back to it. I just thought, wow, you know, yeah. everything, everything Joel was going through at that point in his life. And a lot of it wasn't that great. That's in there, yeah. you know, a hundred percent. 
Yeah, I want to agree. I mean, I, I remember when Silkworm started, uh, and this whole point about catching up with Joel, like, I, I, I thought then, and I still think Joel was like a staggering talent, like in terms of raw talent of someone who can project a song and an emotion and can play a guitar part that like grabs you by the face and is just awesome, has a presence that's incredible. I think Joel's, uh, he's probably the top. He's like the top talent I've ever worked with or, or, mm. with, or really been with up close. And I'll say he's the single biggest musical influence on me personally of anything because of that early exposure to someone who's like kind of a colossal kind of like talent like that. And on this record, I think that there's, you know, two masterpieces. There's Garden City Blues and Dream 8. And there's two near masterpieces, which are Raised by Tigers and Pilot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Joel was like fully realized and it was just, you know, it sounds cheesy, but I'll just say it. It was it was like an honor to be there and be part of it. Yeah. And um, he had he has songs like that on the first record too. There's this song. You know, it's not like he was perfect. There's some song you're like, oh, that's an exercise and it's good and it sounds cool because yeah. it's you and it's us, but you know, whatever. Yeah. But then they're like this there's a song Little Sister on the first Silkworm record. You're like, fuck. Like <laughs> yeah. that's amazing. <laughs> and he had this ability to distill things um that taught me a lot. Like stuff I I wouldn't have probably picked up the way I picked it up and it's in the way I play guitar or yeah. bass, yeah. you know, and, and, and Andy's influence too is in, the, it's just so interwoven into, into the way stuff comes out now, but he, he had this ability. And again, he didn't always hit, not that any of us did, but when he did, it was like supernatural, you know? Yeah. It was like, exactly. Oh, that's really good. It was like, what's happening. Yeah. You know? That's like for all time. <laughs> yeah, 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 totally. Raymond Derek quote, quote, yeah. Yeah, that that track, that track Dreaming will live you can't uh, break it, you know. Yeah. And it's not it's not of a time. It's 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 not connected to anything other than itself, you know. Yeah. So, it's pretty awesome when you can be involved in something like that and have it turn out that way. Yeah. I wish Joel was with us today. I mean, here. I mean, he's he's around. We we tried to get him to join <laughs> us and it didn't quite work out and I Yeah, talked- he's he's on his own thing and oh you did talk to him no i mean i've talked to him on the show i've <laughs> talked to him on the show before is all i meant oh, to say like many years ago oh. and i thought maybe he would uh respond to this request but it didn't work out that's fine it is what it is right i mean he's doing i've always gotten the sense he just does his own thing he does he's a great person yeah i love him and uh you know that's the way it is yeah so one yeah. uh, i th- i don't recall i think it was andy did you bring up raised by tigers i think it was yeah, yeah. i mean yeah, I did. And that's that's another one where, right, it's sort of, for this record, it's a second tier song, but that second tier is awfully high. It would be the best song on almost probably any other record that came out that year, in my opinion. Um, so it's, it's, it's way up there, too. It has that gripping quality and the fully realized quality that, you know, would be on me at the time, for sure. Can I, can I ask you about a, a meta aspect of this song that I'm curious about? Yeah. I'm not sure who can feel this. There is a guitar part in Raised by Tigers, uh, which oh, is clearly the, the, in the mouth of the a infamous. desert by pavement. And I, I just want to know who, who came up with that. Why is yeah, that, that in the song? Me. That was you. <laughs> yeah, that was me. Uh, the infamous guitar part. I had, if I ever knew how many questions this would, would prompt over the last 25 years, I never would have done it. <laughs> or these guys never would have let me do it. We didn't uh, know was pavement it? was going to be pavement at that point. Yeah, we didn't. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, so if, this if is... you listen to the guitar part on that on that song, Joel's playing rhythm, and I'm playing this meandering lead through the entire thing, right? Yeah. And so that's the that's the denouement there, the very end where you're going for the most intensity. So you're looking for something high and squealy, um, and it just seemed like a. I got to be honest with you. I was like, this song kicks ass. I'm going to put this part from this kind of wimpy pavement song in here to show them how much this can kick ass. That's kind of what, kind of, that's what I was thinking at the time. Um, and that's what I did. It didn't quite work out that way because most people just focus on the content yeah. rather than the ass kicking. Okay. Well, I don't mean to contribute to it's that. It's a good line. It's, if, Steve, yeah. if Steve listens to this, good guitar part. Wherever you stole it from. <laughs> Good job mining that. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, exactly. You think he stole it from someone else. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Turning the he tables. Probably took it, he probably took it from the fucking carpenters or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We should say you guys have a relationship no, with Norman Steven. Gr- Norman Greenbaum. 
<laughs> you guys had a silkworm had a relationship with steven as well it's this is oh not, yeah. yeah yeah we're still friends yeah we're, we're i think we'll still be friends after he hears this if he does <laughs> did, did he did was there an, an acknowledgement from him or the pavement camp about oh, yeah. this? yes okay so yeah this, okay. no he thought it was funny i mean yeah you know this is yeah, all, and all and the time and at the time i thought it was funny as well and nobody stopped nobody said no you know and they said no to plenty of other stuff so it seemed it seemed reasonable at least you didn't play Sweet Child of Mine or something like that. Yeah, well, that wouldn't have been funny. I like that there's been two Guns N' Roses references on this uh, <laughs> on this episode somehow. That's amazing. No, I, uh, I, it just stuck out at me as I, you know, obviously I've been listening again to prepare for this, and I didn't realize you've been fielding questions about this for 25 years. I apologize. Well, well I, I have, and I, I should be honest. Like, this is the first one I've fielded in many years, but at the time, it stuck out to people, and we got a lot of questions about it, and it was annoying. Right, um, right. Okay. So because and it was only annoying because we we thought we were what we were, but we got lots of you sound like pavement kind of queries and, and oh right and like hardballs thrown at us, and so that was a bad. It was kind of a bad feed into that narrative. But that is truly ancient history. This is where the twenty five years comes in handy because I probably haven't actually fielded a question about that, or we haven't for fifteen years. Okay. <laughs> okay. Least. Good. That's good to know. Now, I want to ask about the recording. Uh, somewhere earlier, I think it was Tim uh, referenced the fact that Steve Albini uh, was recorded this record. And I know that you remixed it with Steve uh, and you had it mastered at uh, Bob Weston's Chicago Mastering Service as well. So there's that lineage is there. Um, Tim, what do you recall about working with Steve on this particular record? Were there any particularly <coughs> fond memories or stories from that time? Oh, Probably um, we it was the second time we recorded with him because we made an EP with him and like a lot of bands we were like oh it'd be cool to record with Steve Albini and then you and then you ask around and you realize oh here's his phone number and just call a guy and like book time when their first single the which had a cover of the chain on it um, the Fleetwood Mac song came out I remember I was driving near my house in Uptown in Chicago. And I heard this rather heavy cover of that Fleetwood Mac song, which as someone who was around when Fleetwood Mac was popular, it will surprise you very little that I detested Fleetwood Mac <laughs> in their in their <laughs> pop rock heyday. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. So make that, that, um, that checks out for me. I, I can see that. Yeah. Uh, so it was strange to hear um, a, not just a, a reverent cover, but a cover that seemed sort of inspired of a song that I didn't really hadn't really paid much attention to um, uh, or hadn't really appreciated until that point. So I was and so I made a point of hanging out in my car after I got home and waiting for the announcer to tell me who that was. And he said it was Silkworm and they were a band from Missoula, Montana. And I was like, what the fuck? Missoula, Montana, that's where I'm from. <laughs> so I called the radio station because they said, oh, and the dude from the band is here. Uh, and they were talking to him about him them being on tour or whatever. And uh, so I called in and I just said very brief hello to Tim Midget on the radio. Hmm. Didn't mean anything to me at the time. Then it, I realized later that I had met Tim already when my band had played a house show at, in Evanston at Clark Johnson's Clark Johnson lived in a sort of a typical Clark Johnson from the band Bastro mm -hmm. um, and squirrel bait prior to that. He was going to school at Northwestern and he lived in a fairly typical student group house um, where there were just a bunch of dudes and a fridge full of beer and they would occasionally have bands play there. And my band uh, after big black rape man was just getting off the ground. Like we were just getting our shit together and, so we played a show at Clark Johnson's house as a kind of a, you know, just as a shakedown cruise, just to just so that we could get used to playing together in mm -hmm. front of an audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had expected it to be a fairly typical college thing. And I had expected to, to want to chase some of the people out. So we started the show by setting off a brick of firecrackers in the house, which cleared some people. Uh, and then I had bought a can of novelty fart spray, which was just foul smelling spray uh, from a novelty shop. And I had that near me and 
at, at some point in the show, Tim Midget tried to introduce himself to me as uh, a fellow uh, alumnus of Hellgate High School and as a, you know, fellow Missoula Montanan. And I cut him off by spraying fart spray at him. Oh, no. Oh, my God. That, yeah. That... So I was just unconscionably rude to him and my, for no reason in my very first meeting. Right. Did you really both attend a school called Hellgate? Yeah, the high school in our town. There were it. it there were several he- high schools in our town. There was the Catholic high school, Loyola. There was Sentinel High School, which was on the south side of Missoula, and then there was Hellgate High School, which was more cl- right near downtown. And that was the sort of historical high school for Missoula, Montana, is Hellgate High School. Why? Why on earth would anyone name a high school Hellgate? I don't understand. Um, the it was named after the Hellgate Valley, um, and supposedly, I don't know this, I don't know that this is true, but supposedly it was meant to be in reference to the German expression, the beautiful place. Oh, right. Okay. But I don't know that. I don't know that that's true. <laughs> okay. So- um, at any rate, our the Hellgate, the, the, my grade school as well was named Hellgate Grade School. I went to Hellgate Grade School and Hellgate High School. High school. Wow. The sports mascot for our grade school teams was the demons. <laughs> we were the, the Hellgate demons. <laughs> so, this just all sounds like uh, administrators having some fun. That's what that sounds yeah. like. Yeah. You know, like that doesn't sound legit. Sure. Yeah. So we went and made a record, an EP there. And that was a great learning experience on so many levels because like on one hand, the drum sounded cool and the guitar sounded awesome. But like I heard what my bass really sounded like and I was like, I'm not into that, you know. Hmm. And it totally it changed my setup for the better because I was able to hear what I actually sounded like because of the way he does stuff, you know. Yeah. And um, I don't think the one thing I would say Steve's way of doing stuff was almost 100 percent positive. And, and, and good for us. The one place where it probably wasn't quite as good is that he was at the time yet more disdainful of like wait, spending all the time on vocals than he is now. <laughs> right. And we could have used some second or third takes on some of these, <laughs> you know. I hear that especially now. But uh, later on, we got more. Uh, we we grew some balls, and uh, and we would be like, Nah, I got to do that again. Sorry. Right. But um, and we also got more critical of ourselves. But I think that. I remember listening to this thing on tape in the van on the way home, like these crappy tapes. He had like the worst cassettes of all time. That he would, <laughs> that was odd. I think maybe to lower your expectations before the record came out. But, um, <laughs> and it just sounded like amazing to me. Oh, you know, nice. I couldn't, I couldn't believe that we made a record like that, you know, that was that um, start to finish kind of, satisfying you know and like andy said it's not like i even then thought the whole thing was amazing or whatever i just thought in general it was amazing you know and it sounded like us you know yeah which is all you can really ask someone to do if they're going to record you especially when they're going to do it that fast yeah under that kind of duress you know going in at 6 p.m and recording till five in the morning type of stuff that we had to do so, I mean, he was a whiz then, and he's only gotten better at what he does. And uh, it certainly locked us in yeah. to doing stuff with him, because what are you going to do once you do that, and the guitars <laughs> sound like that, and the drums sound like that? You're not going to, like, go make your record. I'm not going to name any names, but, you know, the way a lot of people made him in Seattle, you know? Sure. You're not going to do that again. Right, right. Uh, Andy, do you have thoughts on, on that experience? Not a lot. I remember it being, you know, it was very short. I remember it being very smooth because we were super well rehearsed. We recorded a lot of it at Chicago Recording Company before it was torn down, and that was a pretty good room, and it was comfortable by our standards. So it was kind of, it was a little bit no fuss, no muss. What I remember very specifically was that their approach to guitar, the two, the way the two guitars work together, and the style of playing for the two guitars was distinct from an awful lot of the other bands that were playing at the time. Like there were many styles of guitar playing that were sort of being expressed during that period, but most of them had a kind of crudity about them, like had a, had a kind of amateurish quality mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. And Andy Cohen is obviously just like a master guitar player, and he could effortlessly switch from this sort of 
Metallica inspired sort of fast chugging rhythm stuff to accomplished in conventional terms shreddy type soloing which was a, a, a mode that was not cool at the time at all like that was not you know that would not have been anybody's go-to solution and it, it what I think that speaks to is the the way that their style developed in near isolation in Montana like they they had records and their friends to to re reflect their music from um, they didn't have uh, a sort of overall culture of trend and coolness that they could be a participant in like everybody in a, when you're in a small town or in a town that doesn't have access to like a broader underground culture, the local underground culture tends to be quite perverse. Mm -hmm. And that's true, not just in terms of music, but like, you know, there will be local idiomatic things in language or in, you know, the visual styles of illustrators or cartoonists or whatever. And there will be like modes of dress that are unique to certain places. A lot of that has dissipated because the internet has interconnected so many people. But at the time, it still was very much a, a sort of homebrew environment for everybody that wasn't in a big city like if you if you weren't in a big city and you didn't have access to all of the sort of broad strokes culture you know you were making it up as you went along and so you and i thought it was what was interesting was the way silkworm had put together elements that were not trendy and were not cool by by the expression of the the rest of their peers in, at their contemporaneous peers mm -hmm. but it didn't they they weren't doing it in a sheepish way they were it's not like they were embarrassed that they were into this stuff it's just that they have, had calibrated what was cool differently than everybody else like tim i kind of <laughs> if i could do it again we would have retaken some of these vocals for sure hmm. not joel but me and tim but that's my only sort of technical criticism of it uh it was just we did it really fast is my main memory of it um steve was great to work with like tim just talked about and you know what are you going to do after you do that you're you're kind of done looking around for other alternatives. So in contrast to the extreme dramatic nature of the music, I think the recording process was pretty smooth. So th this relationship between Steve and recording vocals, I've heard this before. I know uh, when he was on the show once talking about how he generally disdains uh, double tracking vocals he doesn't think yeah it's it's a it's a good use of one's time and doesn't sound good and all those which are, is smart right which so is, i think it's smart but do you do you have any perspective on that like the, the singing arguably might be the most emotive aspect of a song uh the most sort of i'm putting myself out there and steve is kind of a hey let's not fuss over that too much does that say something about his personality at the time even like, uh <laughs> i think i think it says a few things i think that he was reacting to this kind of idea of the vocal and the lyric uh, asserting a position of primacy in music uh, you know yeah and and um i would agree with him that um that's overstated in a lot of rock music you know i mean there's a difference between brian johnson and bon scott but it's not night and day yeah as long as you've got the rest of the band doing what they do you yeah. know yeah. and um i think that it's I, I understand it as a concept and to his credit, I know he got more sensitive to that kind of stuff. Like pretty soon after that, you know, working on like working on the Polly Harvey record. I know that she wanted particular stuff to be done with her voice and he flexed to that. And I think, I think he sort of um, realized that, you know, there was this other kind of um, emphasis that you could put on the vocal that was still part of the overall sound, but, it, it didn't didn't mean you had to like just knock it out real quick or whatever. And I will say that as uncomfortable as maybe Andy and I are <laughs> with some of the and Joel has a couple of Yelpy bits on the record too, to be fair. But <laughs> but uh, you know, as uncomfortable as that might make me sometimes from a just a musicianly point of view, you still get the idea, you know. The the emotion of it still comes across. Right. And if it's one thing that's easy to do with a vocal, it's remove uh, sand off all the edges and remove the personality from it. Yeah, um, right. And you definitely yeah. want to do that. I'd rather go the other way. You know. Yeah. 
yeah there are a number of things in play there the vocals are the the thing that it's most easy for the, the thing the thing that's most commonly a, a stumbling block for people who aren't professional singers is that they you know they hear their recorded voice and they feel like they haven't achieved the kind of impression that their favorite singers have made on them and so they feel inadequate and so that can turn into a spiral of doubt instead of appreciating things for whatever their native charms are it can turn into an exercise of frustration where you're trying to do something that impresses you from the perspective of having heard your voice and not being impressed by it you know mm-hmm. there there are a lot of defensive postures that develop from that like now there's a lot of there are a lot of technological solutions to tuning for example which um there weren't then but there were other things like masking a waver in the voice by using reverb to sustain it or masking the sort of diction or the awkwardness of the tonality of the voice by doubling it or multi-tracking it so that you have a, a diffusion of the sound quality and it sounds alien and not as personal and therefore you can't be blamed for it, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, so all of those things, a lot of those things are kind of defensive postures. And in the punk scene, like a lot of that stuff was kind of scoffed at. And, you know, the sort of hierarchical position of the singer as being the top dog in the band didn't really exist in the punk world. And that's kind of where I developed all of my aesthetic at the time. You know, the the singer was just the other guy that did that other, he did the guy that did that part of the band. And the vocals were not necessarily more important than any other element. And, and I, I have come to appreciate there are subtleties about the vocal that do make it more important. The main one being that the vocal on a record is the only thing that's actually a person. Hmm. Everything else is abstracted, at least by the degree of it being somebody playing an instrument. But when you're listening to somebody sing, you're actually listening to that person. And so, of course, it's going to be more important and more personal to that, you know, person. It's going to mean more as a as a an avatar of that person because it's literally them, you know. But at the time, I think I probably had less nuanced comprehension of exactly why people felt the way they did about singing. I just knew that it was the part that often took the longest and then when you're in you know a compressed time setting you don't really have the luxury of indulging fear and trepidation you just you kind of have to get on with the job you know Andy in in contemplating this reissue you had the opportunity to, to remix things which for some people that can be a corrective exercise you know like well yeah. you know i i it's like you're saying like if we could do it over again maybe we would have redone some vocals but was there any kind of corrective impulse in in this reissue for you personally not really everything that we did i think to make i think it is a better mix but i think that's because we nibbled around the edges and made it it has a bigger bottom end i think some of the guitar balance is better these are details though fundamentally it sounds very similar it sounds very similar so there really wasn't any corrective Uh, we even left in we we even didn't de-emphasize the most hateable vocal bits that we you know <laughs> listen to because that's you know that's what's on there and it uh it would have sounded weird i think to try to do that yeah um, yeah and i think of that stuff as being quibbles anyway you know it's like yeah. like i said you get you get now you not only get the idea but the feeling behind it is there 100 percent, and they're not bad they're just not the way you do it today or whatever right right it was a it was a necessity I don't think anybody would have said, you know, for no reason, let's remix this record. The original master was unavailable. Like that was the, the, I for years have advocated for artists by artists. I mean, bands and singers and whoever is making a record, keeping control of their own masters because they are going to treat them with a lot more respect than somebody who just sees them as part of an inventory, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And several of Silkworm's records specifically, the master tapes have been destroyed or lost. Mm. And in the first couple of instances, it's absolutely due to negligence. And there's one where it's due to tragedy. A guy's house burned down, and um, in burning down his house, he lost a bunch of stuff, including Silkworm's masters. Oh, man. Mm. But as in the case of 
the CZ record and the El Recordo record that Silkworm did, the people running the record label just didn't have their shit together. You know? Yeah. Oh, hey, actually, El Recordo was great. They they had all the tapes and they were all in good shape. And plus, they just gave the record back to us. They didn't even think about making us like buy it back or anything just to settle that straight in there. They they put out Libertine and they just they just gave it back to us so we could reissue it anyway. And so I'm, I'm a very strong advocate for it whenever it's possible for bands keeping their own archive just because they they take better care of them. Yeah, no, that makes sense. So and, you know, there's just recently there was that universal fire mm -hmm. where priceless masters were destroyed because universal centralized warehousing in a, a, a place that then caught fire, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, horrible. I, I saw among them, were there any records of yours that you worked on? In I that? have no way of knowing because right. they've been very opaque about what was lost. Yeah. I'd be surprised if there weren't some records that I was involved in that yeah. were lost. Yeah. Well, so in, in your revisiting in the West from your perspective as the person remixing it, um, mm -hmm. were there surprises? Were there things where you're like, oh, shit, this was so great? Like, was there anything like that? Um, I remember very much liking the music. I remembered and I also remembered thinking that there were that the recording displayed some of the limitations of the session, just the slightly my unfamiliarity with them and their style, slightly the limitations of recording in a in a very lim a studio with very limited capability, you know. I wasn't the most experienced engineer in the world at that point, and you know, and we were working out of necessity on a very compressed time frame. So all of those things taken into account, I think the band acquitted themselves tremendously. I think I did an okay job in the day, and I think the ultimate presentation of it is quite good. Hmm. But you know, if the same band came into a studio with me today, I'm sure I could do a better job or a more sympathetic job, um, just because I have more capability now i'm i'm more experienced i could solve problems earlier things like that hmm. okay so that's that's your sense memory of even the remix process is that what you were thinking or during the remix i was like i could tell like there were some minor technical flaws that were embedded in the in the master that i was able to correct when we were doing the remix i mean s stuff that i was either unaware of at the time or wasn't aware of a solution for a problem that was persistent now there's lots of other amazing additions, uh, or, you know, like supplemental uh, content on this reissue <laughs> package. Um, Tim, what do you want to say about that stuff? Um, it's obviously of a, of a time, and it, it sort of captures sort of some process-oriented things as well as a live, some live shows and live songs. Um, what do you want to yeah, say well, about that? The only I, all the live stuff that comes as downloads, I don't even listen to it to be honest. <laughs> right. I just let John Solomon, the, the comedy minus one, just pick whatever he wants because I'm not going to wade through it. But um, okay, I did I did listen to. There's a live version of the Stream Syndicate song Halloween on there, and that's cool. Yeah, and you know the other stuff. It's interesting, I think, maybe to listen to the singles that are on there. And just consider those, they're on the CD version of it, at least it comes along with the record. Yeah. And consider how they contrast with the with the album, you know. It's a slightly different side to the band, different kind of sound. And that sound actually got brought into what we did later on, you know, recording with Steve. Even we learned how to kind of soften up a little bit, I think, in a useful way. Yeah. Um, that started to come out on Libertine. And then by the time the band dropped down to... Um, just the three of us, uh, when Joel quit, you know, it, we really kind of learned to embrace sparseness a bit more right. than we were. It's certainly, um, you know, in, in the West has moments of sparseness, but by and large, it's pretty, pretty, uh, you know, Dense. lots of, lots, lots of stuff going on all the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fair to say. Uh, Andy, do you have any perspective on that, on, on the reissue and all this sort of, uh, added bonus material? I really don't like Tim. I don't listen to the live stuff, not because I don't want to, but because I forget it exists and it's not like a gripping need for me to listen to. <laughs> okay. um, I could see listening to it someday, like on a long car ride just for fun. Uh, Have you ever listened to it? I sure I've listened to some stuff some time, but I certainly have not listened to the full spate of stuff that comedy minus one has put out with the re with either of the reissues okay, okay. or any of the reissues. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. The singles, I think, are interesting, and some of them are very good. Yeah, uh, They're pretty different from the record, which is also interesting. It kind of accentuates that this record's really of a piece. Yeah, um, It's very integrated kind of sound and approach on the record, which is pretty unique. So, yeah, as a source of contrast with the record, they're good. They're good intrinsically. And they do, in some cases, show a little hint of what's going to come later. Right. Okay. That's fair to say. That's that's. I appreciate that. And I appreciate your somewhat, you know, you have a little bit of distance from some of this material. I, I think that's maybe healthy, actually. Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm glad I don't feel the way I felt back then. Now, that would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be very weird. <laughs> so what are you two each up to, so to speak, beyond... Uh, I mean, obviously, Silkworm is not a, a going concern. Um, I know that, you know, I've, I've talked to both of you on this show individually about your respective pursuits. Um, I'm just curious about any updates on, on that stuff. And, I mean, I can't help but wonder. I know there's now a particular geographic uh, distance between you two. And, and I know you've vaguely intersected since Silkworm ended uh, here and there. I Sure. So I guess I'm curious, A, what are you up to? And B, do you ever think you might convene... To, to play together again, you have this long history and bond. Um, why don't we start with Tim? Tim, can you field those questions? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, I can't really imagine not playing again with Andy at some point in time. I don't know when that will happen, given where we are, but, you know, we're kind of attached to the hip, you know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, and I think, you know, we're both glad that that's the case. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we played together in Bottomless Pit, and that was a, that was a band for – way longer than it seems looking back on it yeah probably eight years yeah. and then uh i have a group called mint mile and andy played on the first couple of mint mile eps and now we have uh an album coming out uh, that's done now called ambertron that'll be out in march i just got test pressings of it oh, good. so uh that's a double album somehow that happened i don't know how <laughs> uh i guess one of the songs is really long so that probably helps mm -hmm. stretch it out but um yeah, I'm very happy with that, and I like doing what I'm doing right now. It's I don't think it's very much like either Silkworm or Bottomless Pit in terms of the sound of it, but it just kind of morphed into what it is, and it, I know that the impulse is the same, you know, hmm. which is just a kind of, uh, you know, like I, I said before, it's this very insular process that could very easily stay in my basement, you know, yeah. in terms of the way we play together and interact together and listen to each other and just try to create something that, that works, you know, emotionally and, and, uh, and just in terms of the sound of it. And then you go out sometimes and you play in front of people and they get to hear it, uh, or you make a record and then you get to hear it at home. And, and if it's good enough, other people get to hear it too. So hmm. it's interesting to me cause I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a revocable condition, condition. You know, I, I don't, I don't think that, I could stop doing it. Right, um, right. I don't think I could retire from <laughs> doing it. It's like a, it's like a, a incurable thing, you know. And uh, you know, whatever level I do it at, it's going to be part of my life forever. I think until I, I, I die. I can relate to that, and I appreciate what you're saying for sure. That's uh, that, yeah. uh, fr frankly, that's heartening to hear, and it's not. Uh, not anything to be concerned about, I would say. Good for you. <laughs> no, it's uh, it, but but it, it, it does it does feel, and I think Andy will agree with me a little bit on this. It's a bit like an affliction yeah. because it takes time and it it burns up uh, a lot of energy and stuff that as you get older you have less energy <laughs> and it takes the same amount more or less yeah. uh, uh, to do it. Uh, so you know there's a there's an inherent kind of compromise just in your life that you have to make if you're going to continue to make art straight on through. And it's, it's pretty easy to make that compromise because it's in the end, a pretty indulgent thing yeah. to, to spend time doing it. But, uh, but still, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of that uh, more now certainly than I was when we made this record. Cause when we made this record, you, you're just self-absorbed and you don't have any perspective on anything really. <laughs> well, again, it's good. Your self-awareness is, is good. It's, I think it's all very, <laughs> all very healthy. Uh, and Andy, sort of similar line of questioning. Uh, what's up next for you? And um, yeah, I, you remember the questions. I don't need to repeat them. Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. Well, it's funny because, you know, I agree with Tim that we are pretty joined at the hip. And um, substantively, I think, 
maybe it's because we grew up together doing this and we taught each other how to do it. I don't know. And not, even though we're old now, it still flows through. I do think there's a unique thing that happens when Tim and I play together. And I have kind of two data points on that. One is my wife has mentioned it, which, you know, she's a music fan, but she's not like an obsessive weirdo about it. But, you know, she's just like, yeah, it's pretty clear when you guys play together that you, so you do something together that is unique compared to what you do without each other or what other people do. And then I had this moment of clarity. It was very minor, but it was kind of interesting, which was, and, and uh, sorry, this answer is going to get a little bit long. So when I played on the initial Mint Mile stuff back years, a few years ago now, it was fun and I think it's good material and it's cool. And it doesn't quite have that quality that I'm talking about of the Tim and Andy experience. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because and I was basically, I'm a, I was a side by side man in that group when I, when I joined them. And so I play parts and it's not a full buy-in, not for lack of, you know, desire, but just, it's not the way it is. Then <laughs> the, like the week before I left Chicago, Tim and I played a dual uh, acoustic solo thing. I guess Tim kind of played electric, but you know, whatever. Yeah. At a bar where no one was there. It was very old school. We just sit there and played. So I played my set. And at the end, we played uh, Ooh La La, which was a cover that Silkworm kind of made its, its own song. And so we played this song. It was just fine. And then especially toward the end of the song, and we were playing the same chords and we locked in. And we like locked in in this way that was totally unconscious to me. And I was like, oh, shit, I forgot about this. Like, <laughs> and I, I have not experienced that kind of feeling playing music with other people or in Mint Well, sometimes a little bit in Mint Mile because it's still Tim when I played live with those guys, but just in general. And I'm not saying other stuff that I or he has done is bad. I'm just saying there's there's a uniqueness quality there that I was kind of reminded about. So... As you know, Vish, we talked through it in, in excruciating fun detail. <laughs> I put out I put out a solo record solo record in 2017 that you know I'm pretty that I like and I'm proud of with a, a great backup band, a Light Coma in Chicago. And I, I'm sure we talked about this at the time because every time I talk to a good interviewer, the same thing comes up, which is intellectually I want to retire. Like I am yeah. sick of music. I'm sick of playing the guitar. There's nothing else to say. I am not interested in it at all. <laughs> I've thought that for quite a while and I still fucking seem to like have shit to do. Like I, that solo record, I almost feel like I, a compulsion forced me to finish those songs and find a band and record it and spend money and put it out against my will. It's kind of fucked up. Yeah. Cause I, at that time after like mint, after I quit mint mile and, I was going to do that. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to retire. I'm going to take some time off. I'm sick of this shit. I don't want to do this stuff anymore. <laughs> but I, I couldn't. I couldn't. I don't know what the fuck happened. And I'm kind of in the same spot now. It's like, all right, I'm done. Uh, I'll do, I really enjoy doing house shows and solo things, which I do like two or three a year at this point. Yeah. It's really fun for me. Yeah. <laughs> but now I have more songs. So I don't know how it happened again. <laughs> and now I'm like, Oh God, I'm going to go spend thousands of dollars to record this stuff for no reason. And there's a glut of music and uh, I, I'm sorry to go on like this, but it, it's kind of like a negative version of what Tim was saying. <laughs> it's, it's like a compulsion. And I, I know this sounds funny and it is funny and I'm being funny, but I honestly have this, have this desire to retire that I have, as yet been unable to fully execute and i'm way less prolific than tim so i'm certainly you know not cranking it the way tim is but i seem to be unable to fully retire which i'm kind of accepting at this point so i'm going to do some more solo acoustic stuff um coming up probably in new york i'm playing at an opening in missoula which is going to be fun an acoustic set of a missoula history thing that the university is putting a missoula music history thing oh, cool um yeah i'm really excited about that just you know it'll be like garden city blues all over again in real life so odd odd little things like that come up that i'll do i probably will record another record i have enough material right now it's just logistical hurdles about like how much money do i want to spend and when am i going to do it yeah. kind of thing yeah but and i'm not in a huge hurry you can hear from my attitude um but it'll happen um, in terms of playing with Tim again, you know, I just said, you know, it's a pretty special experience. Yeah. Like Tim said, I would love to, I, I just don't know when, where, how it wouldn't surprise me at all. If we do, uh, make the time and figure it out. Um, it wouldn't shock me if we didn't, but eh, I think it's more likely than not something we'll do something again together. 
but uh, that's you know that's where I'm at with that. It's a it's a weird thing. I, I I totally appreciate the alchemy that you're discussing and describing between you and Tim. It comes up. I bring it up a lot with bands and artists on the show, mm-hmm. and also um, there's something pathological about these monsters we create of our own <laughs> making, right? And that we have to keep feeding. Like as I'm speaking to you, I'm over 500 episodes of this podcast and that's i'm in the wow. same, i'm the same boat as you you know like i i 500 like that's a lot that's insane it, well, what's wrong with you don't say that yeah. don't don't don't, don't say it's insane you, got, you have to prep you have to meet new people constantly you have to think of it's crazy a lot of work it is and then there's not that much um i think maybe the subtext of what we're all saying is like I, I, crassly, you know, financially, we're not, uh, you know, we're putting a lot of resources into a thing and maybe not getting them all back. And that's <laughs> that's the affliction part. It's like it is like a sickness, you know, it's not necessarily it doesn't really make sense, but we keep yeah. doing it. So, all well, I, you know, the, the, the thing I've realized is that um, like I just got done touring for almost a month straight, which mm-hmm. is with uh, this band Sun that my friends Absolutely, are, yeah. And, yeah. and are both friends with Greg and Steve and the main guys and Sun. And so I, they've been ha- having me play bass for them and I've done a lot of it this year. I've been on the road a lot. Like way, way more than I have in the last 10 years combined probably. and um, Or 20 years even. But, uh, you know, I'm out for almost a month away from my family. Uh, I got to do my job from the road, et cetera, et cetera playing music that I didn't write, you know, that I was involved in helping record and make, but it's not even my band. And it was such a deeply rewarding experience, partly because I got to go to all these places I'd never been before, but also just because I got to play every night and I played this stuff that's just like so immersive and so takes you so outside of your your common experience, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. By common, I mean usual experience of life, and that's what that's what music does, so like, or creating art does. It elevates you out of the kind of mundane daily existence that that we all have, yeah. and you, that can happen to you as a listener. And it certainly happens. Anyone who's ever played music or made art, I mean, that's what gets you into it in a, to a degree that you can't get out. I mean, I can't imagine not having that in my life, you know. Even as problematic as it is, you know, we have this record coming out next year and I got to figure out, okay, how are we going to play in New York? How are we going to play in Boston? Yeah, are we going to play yeah. in Philly? How are we, you know, are we going to be able to make the West Coast? We know people in Texas. So, you know, when are we going to do all this shit? Uh, it's a pain <laughs> in the ass, you know, but I know if we do it, it'll be great, you know, and while we're doing it, I'll, while we're on stage playing, I'll feel amazing. And, and, that, and part of it is hedonistic. You know, sure, it really is. But I think yeah. there's also an inherent recognition that we are lucky and fortunate to be able to do those things. Like to, to do well, and, it, and 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 I know I don't think about this part of it very much because I just am kind of wrapped up my own thing. But it does bring that experience to other people. Yeah. Like, and I know that, uh, like on these sun things, a lot of people after the shows are just like, I don't even know what happened to me. You know, I was just. I was like blown away by it, you know, and I don't really didn't really even experience it as music. It was just a thing that happened to me. And <laughs> and people say that to me about our records. I just met a guy the other day who was like from Chile, you know, mm-hmm. and he had to he has to order this shit from Chile or stream it or whatever he does. Yeah. But he's like, I don't know how to tell you, you know, how much your music means to me. And I'm like, all right, well, great. You know, um, I didn't make it for you. But I'm glad that you. <laughs> I'm glad you're listening to it, and I'm glad it has some some of the same effect it has on me. I'm glad it has that on you. You know, absolutely. The, and, that's the reward is that we are uh, you and you and more than me probably I would say. But you're providing something of a service for people. No, is, you 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 too. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. I've told so many people about your thing, and I'm like, go listen to this one. Go listen to this one. Oh, go thanks. listen to Stephen Ian McKay. Busting each other's balls, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so it has an impact on people, and it and it it changes their perspective on stuff, at least for a while. Yeah, you yeah. Well, that's good. I don't mean to dwell uh, in in our hardship because it's not. We're we're. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're... I, I I don't know what I would do if I didn't make music. I would be less of a person, you know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would have a, a much poorer experience of life if I'd never started doing it as much as Andy and I in particular like to bitch 
uh, with each other <laughs> about yeah. about this, that, and the other thing. You know, still like like Andy talked about that show before he left. Like there were like twelve people there. It was us playing in this place, the Log Room in Chicago. Yeah. It was great. Yeah, it was a really great evening. And um, you know, I, I'm going to play a couple of solo shows coming up in Chicago this week, and um, I don't know how many people will be there. And it's not going to matter because I'm going to feel the same way about it either way. I'm going to feel yeah, you know, enriched yeah. by having done it. Pretty yes. sure. I think that's what a lot of us do it, it 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 keeps us afloat it keeps us uh content with what we're doing except, yeah. except when i'm hauling my amp <laughs> to the club. i'm not gonna feel enriched by that yeah yeah um, Tim, tim's new tim's new amp might be this camel that or the straw that breaks the camel's back we move, that'll cause retirement quite literally it's quite literally yeah. might break his back yeah yeah be careful <laughs> with that be careful with that Tim. uh do you guys want to talk about uh, so the new out the, the reissue uh of in the west is available via comedy minus one People can go to comedy minus one dot com. Do you want them to follow you or check out any of your wares on any particular uh, website or such thing, uh, Tim? Uh, I'm pretty bad at stuff. Um, I would say the best thing is just to follow me personally on Instagram, and it's just midyet dot tim or no midyet tim with three T's in the middle. Okay. Uh, on Instagram, that's probably the easiest thing to do because honestly, like I have Facebook and Twitter and stuff for the band, and I. I'm just lame, you know. I'm on Twitter too. Same thing. Okay, mid yet, yeah. mid yet, Tim and and Andy. Do you have anything? No, I do even less. I rely on John at Comedy Minus One just to put shows and releases on his website, and that's all I do. Yeah, it's admirable, frankly. I think you're probably more sane than the rest of us. I'm trying to get off of these things myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's hard. Okay, is there a song from In the West that we can play uh, to go out? Uh, you know, for people to hear right now. Is there something I can play? Uh, oh. I would say it's oh, going to be going. Yeah, if I would say if it's going to be going out, it needs to be a little action packed. So I would vote for either uh, "Into the Woods" or "Raised by Tigers." Yeah, good. Okay, so uh, Tim, you're okay with that? Can you pick one? Yeah. Andy did the hev- oh, uh, and- Andy did the heavy lifting by choosing two. Now you have to pick one. <laughs> well, I, we talked about Garden City Blues and Dream Eight before, so if you haven't gotten to those, I'd play one of those. Oh wow, oh, you yeah. went you went in another direction. You did you rejected both of his suggestions. <laughs> oh, you want me to pick one of those songs? Well, no, I, no, no. no well, I'd, I'd like to pick one song. So just one. If if I, <laughs> play, play, play Garden City because it actually starts with vocals quickly, so it's it's got a hook. Okay, all right, Tim, you okay with that? Yeah. Why? Yeah, why, why? Why wouldn't you be? It's. It's really. <laughs> <laughs> it is a masterpiece. To be the artist. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this, this is uh, Garden City Blues by a uh, Silkworm. Tim, Andy, thank you so much for being back on my show and 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 talking to me about this. And again, congrats on this record and best of luck with everything going forward. Right on. You bet. Thanks, Vish.
Very, very special thanks to Steve Albini, Andy Cohen, and Tim Midyet for appearing on this, the 514th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all iOS and Android platforms and also on YouTube, Spotify, and Audio Boom and whatnot. Uh, everything, basically. If you can't find an episode that you heard about and are looking for on any of those things, or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like Creative Control on Facebook, follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative, or follow me directly at Vish Kana. Also, please visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going. Uh, again, there's a $6 tier now, uh, which uh, that mean, you know what that means? I go into my archives from all the interviews I've done for the past, oh, I don't know, 15, 16, what year is it? It's almost 2020, 17 years. Let's say I go into the archives, my archives from the last 17 years or so, and I just dig up stuff and I just share it uh, on the Patreon and uh, the people who pledge uh, or donate rather six dollars or more they get access to that so as i'm speaking to you what have i put up there i put up an uh, interview with da pennebaker uh, i put up an interview with uh bonnie prince billy from 2011 uh, all sorts of things and i'm still i'm just digging into the thing so oh i made a, d- a documentary about the sadies in like 2010 and i put that up there anyway slowly but surely i'm going through that stuff so if you're interested Again, patreon.com slash creative control to support the show and listen to some exclusive content. Thanks again to Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support for this show. Thank you to Jim Guthrie for letting me use some of his music uh, to make the show sound better. You can learn more about him at jimguthrie.org. And thank you very much for listening to this podcast and telling your friends to do the same and perhaps subscribing to it and spreading the word about it because uh, that's the way things go. Uh, as we're speaking right now, it is uh, this will be the last episode of 2019. Uh, it's, the, it's As I'm speaking to you, it's mid-December, and then I'm off, as you heard, if you listen back, uh, <laughs> if you remember, rather. Uh, I'm moving to Edmonton, so adventure awaits, and at some point I will get back to making more episodes of the show uh, once I settle into things. So uh, look out for that. And... Uh, And that's all I want to say. I will talk to you very, very soon. Bye for now.